Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Value of Inclusive Digital Experiences. I am your host, Nicholas Aramuni, and today I'm joined by two very special minds who are going to help me unpack this vital, important question of what is inclusion and accessibility and digital experiences. Lisa, Brendan, thank you so much for sitting here with me. Uh, please do start by introducing yourselves. Uh, Lisa, I'll pass it on to you to do just that. Sure. So thanks very much, Nick. Uh, yeah, Lisa McMichael um, with uh, a digital consultancy proficient, and I'm a, the senior manager for uh, digital accessibility, uh, specifically for our practice. But here today, I happen to be sitting in my bedroom, a bedroom uh, due to circumstances beyond my control. <laughs> and um, I have brown hair. I'm wearing a, a, a white colored blouse. And uh, just excited to be here and be talking about uh, digital accessibility. Awesome. Thanks for being here, Lisa. Brendan, on to you. Hi. Yeah, I'm Brendan O'Hara. I'm also at uh, Proficient. I'm the lead uh, accessibility business consultant here at Proficient. Uh, I am wearing a light blue or blue uh, button-up shirt and sitting on a night nice vintage 1964 <laughs> wood panel uh, background going here. Um, so I've been with Proficient for about seven years, and about six of those years I've been working in web accessibility, uh, and it's become kind of my passion here um, early on in my uh, career. Awesome. Well, thank you for the introduction, and thank you for introducing the wall. I know it's beautiful. I love it. Uh, also myself, Nicholas Aramuni, Head of Brand Experience, here at Userlytics. I come from a senior UX research background, diverse industries, I've been all over the map. It's a long story, I won't explain. Uh, but I am currently seated at my desk. I'm wearing a blue shirt with a bit of orange on it. Behind me is a white wall with some books hanging on floating shelves, a couple of my favorites up there. And also there is a background underglow light going on for some sort of effect. Uh, it's a bit blue, purplish. And I myself am Middle Eastern. I have brown hair and a little bit of a beard. Touch of gray in it. Super proud of it. Um, but that's that's me. So a lot to jump into. Today, we're going to keep it pretty open conversation, I think. I know there's so much we can get into. But the most common thing that's always asked is, why should companies and businesses focus on accessibility? And I always find... There are two lenses to this, but for some reason, people only ever focus on one. I'll start by talking about that first one, which is 100%. If you are, if you have a digital presence, a brand, product, service, doesn't matter what it is. Inclusivity, equity, diverse usability is necessary. We're so far beyond it being not. So if you're not doing it, you are behind. Uh, and I know it's just punchy out of the gate, but it's so important that people realize we're in a globalized world, right? So the more that we have more users coming to our softwares, platforms, programs, the more diverse those needs become. And if we are not adapting to those needs, then the point of UX and technology itself, which is adaptation, evolution, it's almost paradoxical. You're almost working backwards. And that doesn't even include legal policies and standards, all that stuff. People are so far behind if they don't already recognize this and kind of wanted to open up with that and see sort of what your take is on that, uh, Brendan and, and Lisa. Uh, well, I can certainly talk at length. Um, I agree with you, Nick, uh, just to tack onto what you shared. Um, yeah, there's always going to be that legal perspective. We were just talking about that regulations. Uh, they're not going to diminish. They're going to increase. We're seeing that coming up in the e European Union. 2025, that's when the fines are going to start if you haven't become conformant. You just mentioned about the bill in California that's in the legislature. That looks like that's going to get passed. But generally what I like to speak about when it comes to why do we uh, want to make our web experiences, our digital experiences as inclusive as possible, it's right. It's about social participation, um, but it's also there. It's a vast consumer segment. Um, and it's only going to get larger, you know, um, uh, right now, I think in America, 10,000 people turn 65 every day. 
Just think about that. Right now, they're not the largest uh, population. I think millennials are, but they will be the largest cohort pretty soon in about another 10, 15 years. They're healthy. They have a lot of money to spend. Uh, millennials are a, kind of an interesting um, dynamic there too, younger crowd, because they're very tolerant. They are very uh, used to uh, social participation. They expect that just as a normal uh, opportunity for everyone. So I, I think that there's some really interesting forces socially that are at play. Um, and again, you know, you can always fall back on it's the right thing to do. You know, the Americans with Disability Act was pretty clear. Uh, there's two words in that that I, that I think about a lot, effective communication. So, you know, this public accommodation thing gets talked about a lot, and that's it often ends up in the courts and there's a debate. Some judges think uh, web presences are places of public accommodation. Other judges don't. But um, interestingly, though, when you're talking about effective communication, that simply means any of us need to be able to interface with a digital experience, period, effectively. I mean, that there's no, no, I don't think there's any way to reinterpret that. So th that's kind of a lens through which I look at that, you know, how to answer that question. There's like three or three different aspects to it. I think, yeah. I just want to comment that I, I think it was almost comical to the sense that you said we could, of course, always just fall back on it's the right thing to do. I actually love that because I think it places the importance first on foremost is you must. So if you if you choose that it's not a must, well, then at least do the right thing. Like, mm -hmm. I just found that very interesting. I think there's a lot to unpack there. Uh, but I'll, I'll digress on that. Brendan, love your perspective on that as well. Yeah, and I I echo everything Lisa just said. Um, <clears throat> from another perspective too, it's is it a good business choice to ignore? You know, I think the statistic is you know twenty five to twenty six percent of the U.S. population uh, deals and lives with uh, disabilities on a day to day basis. So, um, if you're willing to ignore that much of your consumer base, then I kind of what are you doing? Um, it's you know, it, it seems to be a large population of the community that you're leaving out uh, mm -hmm. if you aren't thinking about web accessibility. Yeah. And that's it's interesting you say that because I started this off by saying lens one is, okay, let's start with everything should be inclusive. And then lens two is, okay, you're in business. If you're a business, now this is, is another lens. Aren't you trying to capture market segments? Aren't you trying to make money, have a greater ROI? Yeah. Right? If, if you're... If you're not testing for accessibility or making your assets accessible, you're pretty much just handing a competitive advantage to yes. everyone else that's in your industry. You're saying, I'm leaving this door open, right? And Nick, you're also leaving the door open for your competitors to be more innovative. You know, like some of the, the biggest tech companies learned a few years back that uh, people with different abilities can be great sources of innovation. Bring them in as talent. Uh, bring them into your research, you know, help them with your prototyping and, and your uh, kind of innovative thinking about stuff. And I will tack on something that Brendan said, too, is, you know, when we talk about disabilities, we often think of the ones that we can see. That is a very small percentage. I've read stats lately that something like only 5% of visible disabilities are the ones that we seem to really focus a lot on. So to consumer segment, like Brendan mentioned, it's so large. What are we missing? Who are we missing? Who are we not addressing in that more like that 90, 95%? And I, I do think some industries like automotive, there's certain brands, I did some research recently, have started really pay attention to that market and, and, and start fighting for it. You can see in their positioning, they want the market. So it's really, I think it's, a, it's finally, it's a really interesting time. It's a gratifying time to see brands really consider this as a, a serious market force yeah it's important too because i think just more so than hey just do the do the work to test for accessibility is nobody wants to see your virtue signaling and you're not necessarily needing to use this as a gimmick it's mm -hmm. quite really i've talked to so many people in my testing brendan perhaps you also agree too and lisa perhaps you do is i've heard people say to me countless times if i see that a brand or website or asset is socially responsible, if I see that they're equitable, if I see they're going the extra mile, I will choose their service or product over another one, even if it's more expensive. Because I know that there's a genuine care back to that do the right thing, right? So 
if we're talking about how you increase your customer base and how you become more competitive and you want to be a proper business, the whole point of business is growth. You need more users and you need it to be genuine. And that's the best marketing you can have is word of mouth saying this place is, you know, this asset is super, super accessible. This, this asset really cares about its people. And now you have loyalty, community, marketing, all these mm -hmm. sort of very important aspects from my perspective. Uh, and in the broader spectrum too, and maybe you guys have seen this in your work is eventually now people are going back and redoing their assets. They're redoing their presence, which is just costing them more money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but if you would have just done it to begin with, you probably wouldn't be here. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and that's, that, that gets to kind of one of my main, you know, kind of trouble points with, you know, a lot of the clients I work with is I always focus on trying to stress on, you know, let's focus, uh, let's shift things as far left or let's uh, shift things or push things as far upstream as possible. Um, you know, start from the beginning, whether that's, uh, you know, content, web design, um, let's start there, uh, making sure that access web accessibility is taken into account. We don't want to wait until, uh, you know, designs have been made, uh, mm -hmm. code has been formed, and then we're just in the QA phase to, you know, figure out all these uh, accessibility issues. It's it's going to cost you more. It's going to be more time consuming. Um, and the end result is not going to be perfect when you do it that way. So making mm -hmm. sure that, you know, from the beginning of the workflow um, that we are considering web accessibility is, I think, very key. The difference between trying hard and playing catch up, right? Right. If you're, if you're trying hard and it's still not perfect, there's a bit of grace there. But if you're playing catch up, well, you're playing catch up. By definition, you're on a trail, right? So it's a very important part. One of the things that comes to mind to sort of just move this a bit further along is we know, okay, we can say why. We do this because you need to be inclusive. If you're a business, you do it because you're falling behind. You need to make money. All these things are great. But I've had so many people say, well, how do I even start? <laughs> Where, where's my first step? I think there's a million answers to that question, but I want to leave that floor open to you guys. If someone comes to you and says, hey, what are some things to look out for and how do I start? What What's the first thing you think you tell them? What does that look like? So I guess I'll, I, I don't know, Brendan, if you want me to start, but, um, you know, I think what I would advise an organization to do, always do the research first. You want to crowdsource participation. You, you, no one wants to find out, hey, even if it comes from top leadership, let's say at the chief level, officer level, at that level, that now we're going to have this new initiative and everyone has to learn this stuff and get on board. That doesn't really come across as it's certainly not participative. Um, if you, if you want folks to get engaged in, in the process of standing up inclusive design and really thinking about, um, about your product from who are we excluding when we make this design choice or we, leave off or we write a really uninformative set of alternative texts for images, things like that take a lot of uh, commitment. You know, it's not easy work to do even something what we might call as simple as uh, writing content for alternative text uh, for tags for uh, say images or informative information for links that takes real commitment and discernment. So back to, I would, I would always start with, um, as far up the leadership ladder as I can go and say, let's do some interviews. Let's find out from your teams what they think. What do you think? What what has been your experience? Say even standing up a center of excellence. You know, is that does that sound too ambitious? Has your organization ever done something like that before? It's not as complicated and ambitious as it sounds, you know, because really though that interview process, talking to key stakeholders, this is something I went through with our large client last year. You know, talking to about 23 different people across 13 or 14 interview sessions. And when I brought the readout back, everyone was like shaking their head like, yep, you captured exactly our sentiment. 
And then there was a lot of agreement, which was good. I can't say that's always going to be the case. But what we learned is um, a few things. One is you can't just give folks information like requirements and expect them to know how to get started. So we heard the mantra was teach, don't tell. We're going to have to have training. We're going to have to understand who is it we're doing this for and why. Why does it really matter? Who's going to support us in this work when we get stuck? You know, how, who's going to help us? So, uh, but they also agreed, yes, we need to do this. Yes, um, we want we want to get to that repeatable stage of maturity. And we think we can if we have the right guidance and the right framework. Well, that's where, you know, we can even maybe be managed. Maybe we won't be innovative ever in terms of using accessibility. So I would always say back to your initial question, uh, don't get don't get started until you bring the right folks into the conversation and make it broad. I mean, it needs to be HR and compliance, legal, digital, um, folks from QA, uh, folks from different areas of engineering, uh, marketing, uh, product management. I, you know, I could go on and on. And you want and you want people at different levels. So you may want somebody at a high level or two. And then you want people that are more getting started. So representation really matters in understanding where is an organization? How much appetite do they have for this? How much budget investment do they have roles in place like one or two that are going to help lead this? So that's how I would say get started. You know, it's not a unique project or it, it's just a process and get your roadmap. And then that's, those are the inputs to start your roadmap. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Not a, not a project. It's a process. I think is, there's a lot to unpack. Oh, yeah. If you're listening, that that means a lot, right? It's not just uh, okay. We'll put this together, scale it, and go. No, no, this is lifelong. <laughs> you wow. gotta strap up and get into it. Uh, Brendan, thoughts it's on enhancing your product, product? It's just enhancing your product. Continuous improvement. Excuse me, yeah. Brendan. Yeah. yeah, it's it's not a destination; it's a journey, right? That's the mantra I seem to go. I seems to be in my head all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we all, you know, in this industry. Um, you know, the, the golden, you know, goal, the goal is, you know, if anybody could have it is user testing, right? If we could have those that are living with these disabilities actually test and tell us what's wrong, uh, what mm -hmm. they struggle with, the challenges that they, uh, you know, encounter, that'd be great, right? That's the, that's the goal, but that's not always the case for most of us, right? That's just not how it is. Um, so from that point standpoint, it's what can we do to um, ingrain in our testers, our developers, our designers, what they should be looking for. And a lot of the times what I do with my testers is, um, you know, I talk about using assistive technologies. Mm. Um, and the main one would be, you know, the easiest, the easiest one for people who haven't had experience as assistive technologies is uh, screen readers. And so to me, it's, you know, making sure that they take some time and it may take a decent amount of time to get used to them. Um, but taking that time to understand truly what the experience is for people who deal with these or live with these disabilities on a day to day basis, how they would in interact with that particular Web page. Um, that's kind of my, always my first step is kind of ingraining that in their head, um, you know, saying that, you know, life isn't always easy as a mouse user would be right. Um, you know, they're using the keyboard, they're using braille keyboards, they're using gaze trackers, they're using a, a total assortment of assistive technologies. And, um, so from my standpoint, from, you know, helping to manage QA teams, helping to provide, uh, uh you know, more advice to dev teams and design teams is uh, really brought from that experience of how those technologies work and how they rely on both mm -hmm. the content that's provided as well as the HTML code that's provided. Um, yeah. You know, as, you know, assistive technologies such as screen readers, uh, you know, high, you know, really depend on HTML, correct HTML, semantic HTML um, to convey information to their users and so if that's not there then you know you're really set back quite a bit um and you're then forced to kind of 
uh, jerry rig things uh, into existence, right? To make it suitable for those who are using those assistive technologies. So I think the, the starting point is if you're getting involved in, um, you know, accessibility testing, accessibility design, um, coding is to immerse yourself in the world of assistive technologies. And I would, I personally would suggest, you know, download NVDA, download a screen reader of any kind, literally any screen reader, and just see how it, see how it is. You know, close your eyes, put your mouse away, use your keyboard, and, and see how you can interact with that particular web page. Yeah, and you make a great point. Well, actually, the point that you had just made too, Lisa, and then also you, Brendan, about, you know, it's, it's an always changing, it's never stopping, and then you're saying, get yourself immersed. I think those mm -hmm. go hand, and where I'm trying to go with this is, I've run tests before, and I've had different people using different types of assistive technologies. They've had two or three different types of screen readers, and those all operate differently. Well, why is that? Because those screen readers are constantly testing and evolving and trying to adjust to the market. So there's it really just opens up this whole world of this doesn't stop. And I think you make a very important point here that I want to jump into is empathy building with... Mm -hmm right with you getting into technology and you're getting into testing and you want to know what it's like and even answer that first question why should we test well i encourage somebody to mm -hmm. put a blindfold on use a voice responder go on a site that they're even half familiar with and then tab explore that page and tell me if it's the same experience i promise you <laughs> it isn't even if you know that amazon has its search bar in the top middle and you can get to your you know, log in from the right-hand side, I'm promising that person that they are not going to be able to navigate the site the same way. And I think that if, how do you get people to, to understand the importance of it? Make them a tester. <laughs> That'll change your mind <laughs> very quickly from my perspective, or perhaps you guys disagree. I don't know, but. Uh... No, I, I understand. Yeah, It really changes your, your whole perspective on the internet. Uh, and in general, I mean, just life in general. Um, uh, you know, I started in web accessibility close to six, seven years ago. And before I started, I had no idea. Right. Mm -hmm. But as soon as I opened up, you know, a screen reader and spent some time, you know, trying to use it, uh, it really opened my eyes. Um, and so I, I feel like that's an important thing for, I think, everyone to do. Uh, and then much more you know those who are involved in this sector of you know the industry you know uh, making sure that whether you're a QA person a design person a dev uh, a developer or a project manager product owner um, you know understanding how people will um, con consume your website or consume your content I think it's very important I have a question for the two of you, and I know I'm not the one supposed to be asking the questions, but it's more, yeah, ask away, please. That's a great. Uh... Do, you, do you envision a, a future not far along from uh, not far from now, in which the mouse will just go away? It'll almost be irrelevant because voice and keyboard, but mostly maybe voice, will drive so much of our interactions that that'll help, you know, provide more accessibility, inclusion for so many more people in, in different situations? Yes. <laughs> yes, that's my answer. No, um, Lisa, I think even now, you know, I work in tech and I can barely keep up with everything happening in tech. And you're seeing now, I don't know if you guys saw the Apple Vision Pro goggles. I know they were all over the internet, but I've people, heard about them, yeah. they're navigating with their eyes. They're looking, they're moving. Mm -hmm. oh, reality is changing. And I think that is so powerful. I mean, I don't think they'll ever get rid of a mouse. That's well, that's I shouldn't say that. I'm not sure if that's going to happen soon. They may right. at some point. Um, but it's almost funny how those are going to converge, right? What's the difference between being yeah. user friendly and accessible? Not much, right? So you kind of start to see this nice blend. I I think we almost have to get there. Uh, you make an important point about aging populations and what if they're trying to get somewhere to buy their medication and they can't use a mouse or they can't like these things got it. There has to be solutions for these problems. At least I hope there are, or there should be. Overall. Yeah. I think, 
I think both Microsoft and Apple are doing like a heroic job of coming out with new adaptive uh, te technologies all the time. I was watching a video that Apple released about six months ago called I'm, I'm the Greatest using Muhammad Ali's slogan, the greatest. But they're showing some of those technologies like a, a mother who's deaf. She's in the kitchen. She's got an Apple watch on. The baby cries. Of course, she's got her back to her baby. She doesn't. But the watch alerts her. So immediately she acts. So that's just one of many examples. Another was, uh, you know, using your face, like moving a muscle to take photographs on your, you know, with your MacBook. And uh, so, you know, I like that they're in an arms race to provide more inclusive solutions. I find it hard to keep up, but it's super exciting to watch, you know, them uh, kind of go at it. And I think Amazon too is in the, in that space innovating as well. Mm -hmm. Trying to, try. I think they all are. Meta is, I mean, I don't want to talk yeah. about that. Meta, please nobody jump on my back. But uh, yeah. Meta is innovating in that space as well too. They were really gung ho on this whole uh, adaptive generative AI, metaverse, all these different components mm -hmm. that they were talking about. Maybe it slowed down a bit, but I agree with you. I think healthy mm -hmm. competition is the most important part of, of evolution, human advancement of any kind, not to get too philosophical, if you will. Uh, but Brennan, I didn't give you a chance to answer it. Curious, where do you think we're going with that? Mm -hmm. I, I think it's actually really interesting. Uh, Lisa, you mentioned a point about, you know, uh, the technologies that, you know, I, uh, Apple and Microsoft are coming out with. Um, you know, if you think about it, a lot of the technologies that are so we're so used to, you know, people who don't have certain disabilities are so used to now, I think many of them came from uh, the needs of those with disabilities. I mean, for one example, it's, you know, uh, sure. those with, you know, either heart issues or have diabetes. Uh, mm -hmm. The Apple Watch is able to, you know, do certain things, read certain health statistics and convey them to you. And that's not that's not just useful to people with those conditions, but to people who just want to keep track of their health. Um, so I, it's almost like you see them as kind of industry leaders, you know, in those areas is like, Hey, this is a feature we can provide. This is, um, mm -hmm. more useful. This is useful to people for more people than we originally intended it for it to yeah. be. So, uh, yeah. that's exciting to me. It's, yeah. It's interesting because we go back to that point that you had made is it's important for innovation, you know, for businesses is you think about Fitbit that came out and was really focused on health. And then I'm not going to say one came before the other because I don't know the statistics. I don't want to get it wrong. But then you see Apple take this innovation and well, we've got this watch that does everything a Fitbit does and it does more. And then Samsung comes along and, oh, we have a watch that does everything Apple does. But again, Where's the line between what's accessible and what's user friendly? It's actually relatively the same thing, like in, in genuine. So, yes, you have this competition, but everybody's exactly. winning, I think, if we're going through that process. Now, we're on the topic of technologies, but I almost want to bring it back to this. Where do you start? How do you get started? Is there are these excessive tech or there are these assistive technologies? There are these many routes, but I think it's important for people to know that it's actually relatively simple to start, not easy. Huge difference. <laughs> Simple to start. Where do you start before you even crack a test is go look at the web content accessibility guidelines. Please open it. Take a look because they are to accessibility right now with heuristic principles were to UX when they mm -hmm. first came out. Here are nine or ten things that you should probably do. They're not hard loads completely, but here's a good benchmark. Uh, now you've got some information you can pull some information, you can work the idea, test the idea, make sense of it. And then to speak to those technologies, there are tons of platforms, assets that can help you work in that accessibility testing to help you become more familiar, provide education. And I think that's really where network partnerships come from. Um, regardless if you're working in automotive or regardless if you're working in health and medical, these principles stay relatively the same. So talk to people. Get get some education, have a conversation. Worst comes to worst, you hire a consultant to give you a walkthrough. But all these sort of there's all these reasons why you could. Why haven't you? 
You know, it's very simple to start. Start with the guidelines, start with the network, start with some conversations. Uh, I think it's just a, a great perspective for me. Perhaps you guys may not feel the same way. I know there's other ways you're saying, you know, don't just jump into testing right away. And you shouldn't. But again, to go back to what you had just said and what you and I spoke about is, okay, you want to run an accessibility test, put a blindfold on, get a screen reader. You're the tester. There's your first test. You don't need to have much education to figure out something's wrong with your site, right? So just, I think, worth pointing out. Um, any Again, any thoughts on that, guys, as we move yeah, on? Yeah, I, I think it's hard um, to, you know, from my experience, my professional experience in onboarding, you know, new employees or new testers or new, you know, business analysts, those creating the requirements for web. Um, you know, it's really hard to, go ahead and just say, Hey, go ahead and throw on the screen reader and tell me what you think. They don't, you know, they, they won't know. It's impossible to know. But at a certain point is, is it's almost baptism by fire is, and that's kind of how I've, I, that's pretty much how I got into the, the industry was, you know, kind of baptism by fire. We had a client who needed the accessibility and my kind of, I was just thrown in and, you know, I learned, Right. Uh, but that's not always the case with, you know, certain, you know, uh, requirements for, you know, whatever your company may be doing. Um, but I do still think that understanding how assistive technologies work in, uh, you know, the bare bones of them is very important. And so that's why I think learning to understand uh, how a screen reader works is very important because, the screen reader, again, is one of many different assistive technologies out there. Uh, but it's also conveniently one of the, I think, one of the most easiest to understand and use as someone who's never used assistive technologies before. So if you can grasp a little bit, at least, of how uh, users actually you know, you know, use a, a screen reader, um, you can do a lot with that. Um, whether that's through the understanding of how HTML works or how the content on the screen is read off or how descriptive you are with certain content. Um, you know, all of that comes into play while you're using a screen reader. So that's always my kind of, you're getting, in, you're getting involved in accessibility testing or providing requirements for assistive or to make a website accessible, you know, check out how a screen reader works and spend some time. It's not something you're going to be able to figure out in a day. I can promise you that it, it does take some time. Um, you know, there are some settings, user settings you can change within a screen reader, depending on which one you're using to make it a little bit more palatable. Um, but it's going to take some time and that's just how it is. Um, you've just got to dive in and immerse yourself in it and just learn, um, you know, how certain people, you know, uh, digest and uh, take in online content. Yeah. And I think that's really important. The, the irony too is if you are uh, a person who is low vision, blind, color contrast deficiency, you have to do the same. You know, it's, it's not going to be any easier uh, for anyone really. But the good news is those tools I think are getting a little more robust and easier to use. But um, I think to, to tack on to what Brendan just said, I think for me, I don't do a lot of testing, but I often get asked to pop in and help out and support on testing. And something that I picked up a little easier than the screen reader testing, and I'm on a Mac, so that would be voiceover, is uh, just keyboarding, just kind of learning how to tap through just some simple behaviors and then it was easier for me to make the connection to then when I went over to voiceover, I'm somewhat doing the same thing. But the other thing, interestingly, early in my career, when I was just 100% a designer, a colleague of mine noticed I was using a mouse and he said, uh, and he was an independent contractor. And he said, you know, you're actually wasting a lot of time using your mouse. If you just memorize. And of course, this was a long time ago when there weren't as many keyboard commands, but he said, if you start memorizing, especially some of the ones that you use constantly and will for the rest of your career, you're going to save yourself hours, you know, and be way more productive. And I have, I've never forgotten that advice and I've adopted it. And I still, I still, you know, when I find an interaction, I'm like, oh, if I just memorize the keyboard shortcuts, you know, I can just 
fly right through this because I'm going to be doing this a hundred times, you know, on this particular project. So, so really, I mean, there's a, like an interesting synergy between all these things that we're talking about when we talk about tools, our abilities, um, things like that. Um, I, I don't think there's a huge delta or difference between a person who has to use a keyboard all the time before and in, in contrast to someone like me who prefers to try to rely on the keyboard as much as possible because I just find it efficient to do that. And eventually I'm hoping to move away from the mouse pretty much altogether. I'm sort of retraining myself to get less dependent on it mm -hmm. because I have a hunch it's going to be less important in my future anyway. So, you know, just kind of move in that direction a little bit away from the mouse, focus on the keyboard and maybe voice. I've been using voice a lot more, playing around with voice commands and things like that with my iPhone and my and my laptop, just to see, is this helping me be more productive or is it slowing me down? Yeah, it's interesting because I actually find myself doing the same thing with voice commands as well and trying to navigate my way around. And I feel like that's only going to get more dependent. Like we just said, I think it's something that I have to get used to and I want to get used to because it helps me be more efficient. And of course, that irony point that you made was either way, whether you're forced to have to use a screen reader and learn or not, people go through the same experiences. There's this learning curve. There's this challenge. It's mm -hmm. hard. It made me think of something that was super impactful. Brennan, I know you, you talked about, you know, jumping in the fire per se to get into UX testing. My first UX test ever, I was talking to somebody and, sorry, I was talking to, I think it was 11 people for this little test. Every single one of them, when I asked, how do you, how would you want, or how would you, how would you advise this company to be more inclusive or accessible? All of them, I'm not kidding. This is not an exaggeration. 100% all said, I just want them to think and act as if they had a disability. Accessible. Mm. They had exceptionality. And the first one or two times I heard it, I just kind of wrote it down, thought about it. But when I went back and looked at the study, I was like, man, isn't that just the whole basis of, of what we do is feel like the per empathy? Like, what does the person want? And in one particular instance, and I, I always find these two correlated, very impactful for me. I ran a study, this is separate, but... I, I could tell one particular person was quite frustrated and they weren't able to navigate the asset. And when I asked, how was your experience? They responded with, this site makes me feel like I have a disability. Mm. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. Right? Now I feel how he, how he or she feels, right? So I'm going, this kind of all sort of ties back together. That empathy, understanding the tools, that synergy that you're talking about. I've never forgotten even hearing those, hearing that come out of that person's mouth is just, this is wild and so important. You see the impact of why these things have to exist um, by extension. You know, Nick, I've been kind of coaching some of the, the clients that I'm working with pretty much day in and day out. When I talk with teams, especially who haven't been around me very much, I always talk about user stories. Don't talk about requirements just yet. Put it in that context. Talk about the stories people are experiencing. What are their goals? What are they trying to achieve? And what, what? how can we map that to at least one persona? Can you create a universal persona? Maybe that's dumbing it down. But, you know, we I'll try to introduce, you know, four different personas uh, to, to kind of show the variability it could be situational, it could be temporary, it could be permanent. But, um, uh, you know, people grow in and grow out of certain uh, situations and disabilities. Um, but I think that's one of the things that there's still a lot of work to be done is helping organizations look at this no different than they have before when they create personas and stories. It's just we're, we're looking at it through a little different lens. About, and, and that lens is like language. Are you really thinking a lot about the languages in which, you know, you're you're interacting with in terms of your experience and also location or technologies, but their abilities. What Lisa can do one day, she may not be able to do another day. I may be able to spend more time online one day and another day. You know, if I've got a migraine, 
hypothetically, maybe I can only be online for a couple, three hours, you know, I'm, so I think I'll say this and I'll step back, but I keep telling people more and more, um, our work as digital makers and thinkers is, is becoming more like industrial designers and architects. They have to think about safety and functionality and performance all the time. Is this really going to work for the vast majority? Is it fit for purpose? Maybe that's the terminology I've heard. Is it fit for purpose? And I don't, and I think digital, even though it's been around for about 30 years now, we're still not quite mature enough to compare ourselves to industrial designers and architects who've had to think about human ability. Can someone really reach that cupboard? Can they actually use that device? And but I think we're 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 moving into that more and more thanks to awareness of the importance of inclusive design. Yeah, I agree, and I think that ties back to a point Brendan made earlier. It's not even a point; it was the word he used: ingrain this mm-hmm. into people. That that's what it is. It is just there's persona, basic level, ingrain, accessibility, basic level, ingrain. That's it. <laughs> that's the core. Yeah. You know, that's not as simple, but anyway, it should just be. It just it just should be part of it, right? Yeah. Um, there's it's, at a certain point, I'm kind of thinking like, why am I even my own special team? You know, as an accessibility analyst, like, why <laughs> is this? Why am I my own person? Why am I own, my own specialist? But there is a reason, obviously, right? Yes. The industry hasn't kept up, but to me, it's my own, my own personal feel is like this should just be how it is. Um, yeah period. Yeah, absolutely. I know that there's so many statistics that show the negative implications of not. There's, I mean, I could list off millions, 71% of people who have accessibility needs leave a website right away, right before, right if they find out there is no dark mode. Or Sorry, what, what, was, what was the statistic? 71% leave right when they get on a website if they feel it's not accessible. And sometimes it could be as simple as dark mode. That's where I always think of like, why was this not thought of? How is this not Hey, everything that's black turns white. Everything that's white turns black. Like, you know, it, it's something so back to that part. So simple, so easy. It should just be so natural. And we've made some evolutions, but a lot more room to grow, which takes me to this sort of closing thought, closing segment, which is really, where do we go from here with AI, accessibility, mm-hmm. technology? What are your guys' thoughts? Where are we going? What is this sort of new, exciting realm or perhaps scary realm that we might be entering here? I mean, I think it can, it can, oh, go ahead, Lisa. No, no, go ahead, Brandon. Yeah. Um, So I think, you know, and I think Lisa will mirror this is that it can both help and hurt, you know, Mm -hmm. the accessibility experience. Um, What I get excited about is uh, the fact that AI might be able to, provide more descriptive experiences on the web without so much manual effort. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, from the uh, clients I work with, you know, you've got web authors, you've got content uh, teams. Um, Part of that might just be able to be shifted off to, you know, um, AI Mm -hmm. uh, and it would work, Um, you know, and I'm sure there will be, it'll have its faults, right? Um, but I think the level of manual effort involved might be decreased with something like AI uh, to help you with that. And so on a certain level, I think it'll help. On the flip side, you know, not everything that's uh, generated by, you know, a program is perfect, right? What? Uh, Since when? (laughs) So (laughs) so there's always that, right? So, you know, it's got its, it's got its, it's got its, you know, it's the yin and yang. So, you know, it's got its <laughs> and it's got its, it's got its good parts. Right. So yeah, I'm yeah. excited for it. I think it's um, got a lot of upside. I just think how it's implemented is, is kind of critical to it. Um, we'll have to wait and see. Yeah. I don't have a whole lot more to add to what uh, Brennan shared other than maybe a, a little nuance. Um, you know, I think of, of it very similarly in that, we do have to have some guardrails in place. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think now it's really going to be up to the organizations, you know, the, the tech organizations that are developing and, and building out solutions with AI at the center of it all. They need to have some level of, I would call it moral responsibility 
to think about what's the impact of this. So it's, is it going to help everyone or is it going to help some people and it's going to harm others? And um, so that's where the guardrails have to come into play because um, people with disabilities are already struggling with discrimination. I mean, we're what, 33 years away from the passing of the Americans with Disability Act. Yeah. And, and we still have judges trying to figure out, you know, is this effective communication or was this not? You know, it, it, we should we should be so much further along that judges shouldn't have to be deciding these matters. It should be organizations who want who want as many people in society to participate with their product, their experiences in their communities, whatever. So I'm just slightly not fearful, but cautiously optimistic that most people are going to get it right, but there are going to be situations where it's not going to be fair um, and uh, to, be, to certain web users or, or positive to them. But to Brendan's point to be more tactical, even thinking about the, the Be My Eyes organization, I was just reading something, you know, this is where AI could come in and step in similar to what you could do with your iPhone, depending on your version, you could hold it, hold it up to a sign and it'll read the sign to you. You'll know, do I want to enter? Is that a men's restroom or is that a women's restroom? Is that theater one or is it theater seven? And my movie's not in theater seven, it's in theater one. So, but it, it just gives more independence. I, I'm hopeful that we'll see a lot more independence available for more people uh, to really reach their human capability, that they don't have to have assistance from another human being all the time. Uh, that's one thing that I'm looking forward to soon happening. I'm also, I'll say one more thing, and then again, I'll step back. I've been doing a lot of research in the automotive space, and we previously FinServe and stuff like that, but automotive is really interesting with all the electric vehicles and the glut of them on the market now, but they're kind of sorting out what to do with all that. But um you know, I introduced the idea in this talk I gave to our automotive group that will, will especially younger web users and drivers, do they really even want a car? I mean, in Atlanta, I see people going down in on major streets in downtown Atlanta, heavy traffic hoverboards, electric bikes, scooters, all of that, and uh, uh, and of course ride sharing. So I see more older uh, web users saying. I'm going to ditch the car. I'm going to ride share, you know, because it's going to be probably more affordable. Uh, I don't want to drive. My my kids don't want me driving. So I'm very, I'm very stoked about how AI can leverage more independence for people. But in closing, I, I'm also aware that um, it can be like other algorithms used to as a form of discrimination, whether indirectly or directly. So. I mean, I, I wish I had more to even say to that. I just, I actually really don't. When I when, it, what I will say is, there's this there's these this mirror between what's really cool, quote unquote, and what's almost dangerous, right? Uh, there's some great things that can be done. AI algorithms can definitely, you know, hey, run check my website if it violates any of these accessibility principles. Go, okay, AI runs that. Or maybe there's personalizations in the AI software that someone uses that when they get to a site, it knows to use this type of screen reader or this type of auditor or whatever that looks like. I think that's amazing. But you make a very important point is that there's this huge ethical boundary. <laughs> there is this huge ethical and inclusive in and of itself boundary that exists. So yes, great AI is here. And then you go, but is it for everyone? <laughs> and you know, I don't want to be starting from ground zero and how is AI inclusive? I think that's going to put us back forever. But I will say this because I'm always an optimist. 40 years ago, I'm sure my, you know, grandmother's mom said, the future is scary. Be very careful. <laughs> you know, I, <laughs> that I'm not young. And here we are, you know, everything's yeah. working out okay. It's going all right. It's not bad. I, I'm an optimist. I feel like most things are good. If they're not, I'll tell you they're good anyways. Um, but I feel like we got to just work together and help this thing work out. That's all it is. It's just you know, back to that idea of find a network, talk to people, come up with solutions. And, and AI is going to be great. Tech is going to be great. But it's like constant need, you know, I think to work together is going to be the most important part. So, um, yeah. Team. 
I think that's it. I think we've covered a lot. We sort of jumped ourselves into why do we need it? We talked about business. And then we sort of jumped into how do you get started? What are some of the implications? And of course, ending off in the future. But I do want to say a huge thank you to both of you for having such an open conversation. Lisa, incredible. Brendan, thank you as well. Very impactful. Uh, hopefully, you know, people are going to look at this, realize there's, there's an onion here. You know, we can't cover everything. So if they peel it back, if anything, please try and jump into your first accessibility study. If you haven't before, you know, do it. Put yeah. the head, you know, again, put that uh, blindfold on, get on a website, use a voice to or text a voice and just try it right now. There's your first test. Take an action. Um, and if you are testing, I think most important saying I've ever made up here in UX research in my life is test everything, test early, test often. Yeah. This is not a one trick pony. You are not going to get it right the first time. If you did, I would not be employed. Um, so, so just keep testing, keep trying, uh, keep doing, yeah. it. you know, it's not stop. Right. Yeah. This is great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks for being here guys and wishing you all the best in your UX testing journey. That is all from now.